Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. My name is Chiara Giorgetti, and I'm a professor of law at Richmond uh, Law School. I'm delighted to welcome you today uh, in this very important panel, Territory, Tribe, and Trade, the symbiotic relationship between states and individuals in a state-state dispute settlement. This is such an interesting topic. Um, as we know, international law is the law that applies to states, international, that applies between states. Uh, but of course, this is really not true. As I always tell my students, we don't have like a state, a big state that walks around and, and acts uh, uh, by, by itself. It is really the state idea is a legal fiction. State's behavior is an accumulation of actions by individuals. In these individuals in capitals take decisions that are considered as expressing the will of the state or express the view of the state, for example, in negotiations or individuals on ground that perform these actions. And this can be clearly seen in today what's happening now on issues, for example, uh, of aggression and, and boundary disputes and that sanctions their results and evacuations their results uh, also. So that legal fiction of the state as the central actor of international law somehow obscures the reality that state actions result from individuals and the international rules that govern states action in fact governs individuals. This section, session will examine how state state disputes over boundaries and trade, which are really at the core of uh, the key public of public international law and have developed so many uh, key principles, uh, emerge from the actions of individuals and how their resolutions affect the individuals also on different sides of the boundary and whether it remains maybe fixed or changed. In looking at selected disputes from the prism of individual actions that cause state-state disputes and how the rules resolving the disputes impacted these individuals, in this session, we will take on the theme, what about me in international law and highlighting not just how individuals experience international law in their daily life and contribute um, to its creation, but also what elements in their experience uh, do states that this would take into account and which are, come, uh, uh, are ignored or are highlighted. Examples of this uh, symbiotic relationship between state and individuals include issues of determination of compensation for impact on livelihood, the displacement of individuals or communities, or, or where boundaries are redrawn, and how trade rules also can create winners and losers, both at home and abroad. And we will look into the specific issues now with, a, with, very, with this very distinguished panelists. Um, I'm very uh, delighted really to, uh, to have uh, uh, John Crook uh, first, who is a professorial lecturer of law at George Washington University. Law School. He served for nearly three decades and is known to many of us in the US State Department, including as agent uh, at the Iran US uh, Claims Tribunal. He's also a frequent arbitrator in many international disputes and he served as a commissioner in the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission and has also served as a judge at the NATO Administrative uh, Tribunal. Aristeo Lopez Sanchez, a uh, legal consultant now at Clark Hill Law. Uh, and uh, previously, it was a legal counsel for over 10 years with the government of Mexico, including as Director General for International Trade and Director of International Trade Negotiations. Dr. Yusra Seudi is a postdoctoral fellow in public international law at the London School of Economics and Political Science and wrote her dissertation in Geneva on individuals in, uh, in the law and practice at the International Court of Justice, where she's also used to clerk. Dr. Massimo Lando is an assistant professor at City University Hong Kong School of Law, and having obtained his PhD at Cambridge University with a thesis on the establishment of maritime boundaries under international law. Prior to joining City University, he was in a certain legal um, office at the International Court of Justice and also interned at ETLOS. For the first issue, um, I would like to focus on the determination of compensation for um, impact on livelihood. And I wonder, John, if you can start us out and tell us a little bit about the historical perspective uh, and maybe the changes on how the individual has been affected and also compensated and how this has changed in, in, um, in an historical perspective. Uh, thank you, Kiara. Thanks for the opportunity to be on this, this panel, this distinguished panel. Um, and I'm going to do all of that in five minutes. <laughs> I think that'll, that'll be a bit of a challenge, but 
uh, I want to start out thinking a little bit about this whole notion of symbiotic relationship. I mean, it, it's one that envisions, according to the textbooks, a, a degree of mutual benefit. And I'm going to begin with the hypothesis that maybe we, we're moving from a place where there may not necessarily have been a great deal of benefit, or at least the inevitability of benefit to the individual, to a situation where there may be a somewhat greater prospect of that. Now, as, as we know, a, a great many international law rules had their origins in uh, international disputes and the ensuing litigation. Uh, Barcelona traction, uh, Belgium unsuccessful efforts to uh, uh, deal with the losses of its uh, uh, investors in Barcelona traction. I actually have one of the bonds at issue framed on the wall behind me. Has a has a trolley on it. It's very attractive. Um, Oscar Chen, you know, Oscar Chen involved Mr. Chen's difficulties uh, uh, competing with a subsidized competitor, subsidized by an agency of the state. Uh, the Diallo case involving Mr. Diallo's uh, unhappy treatment at the hands of uh, state officials. Now these were all individual cases that gave rise to. Uh, international litigations that generated rules, but ultimately none of them may have done the, well, Mr. Diallo got some money, so it did him some good. Uh, but by and large, this whole process is not one that was necessarily calculated to be an effective remedy for individuals. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. First, under the classical international law of diplomatic protection, these claims by states could only address uh, injuries involving an alleged violation of international law. So a whole universe of injuries, contracts, for example, were out. Other claims under private law were out. And the state was in total control of the process. The state decided whether to bring a claim or not. The state had plenary power to settle the, the claim. Um, it could wipe out the, the, claim, the individual's claim with the stroke of a pen. Uh, it could compromise the claim or settle it for a few cents on the dollars, as, as many states did in the course of their claims practice over the years. And if there was a recovery, uh, it belonged to the state, not the individual. The state might in the exercise of grace, share it with the individual, but this was not required by international law. Now, over time, uh, there has begun to be, I think, something of a, a shift in the practice of some states, at least, uh, away from the rigidities of traditional diplomatic protection. In a little bit of time I've got left, I'll give you some examples. Uh, a major landmark uh, in this process, uh, one in which I had some personal hand, uh, was the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. Uh, the tribunal was created in, as part of a network of agreements negotiated uh, through intermediaries between Iran and the United States to end the 1979 hostages crisis. Uh, before the revolution, the Islamic revolution, uh, the U.S. parties had extensive business and, and investment relationships in Iran. Uh, these were largely shattered by the revolution, giving rise to a whole universe of claims. And to address these, the United States and Iran created a new institution, a claims tribunal, uh, that had very broad jurisdiction to entertain uh, not just the classical claims for violation of international law that might be cognizable in diplomatic protection, but a much wider universe of claims. Uh, and in this process for claims over $250,000, the individual, not the state, controlled the process. And if there was a recovery, and there were many, uh, the claimant and not the state got the money. Now, this generated a good deal of heartburn on the part of some scholars uh, who found this uh, departure from the traditional law of uh, diplomatic protection very uncomfortable and very unhappy and asked how it could, how it could be. Uh, but the fact is the laws of uh, diplomatic protection are not fundamental rules of international law. Uh, states are free to uh, 
deviate from them by agreement. And that is, of course, what the United States and Iran did here. Now, another landmark, the UN Compensation Commission. Again, again I, I, these things seem to follow me around. We did a lot of the foundational work here while I was in Geneva many years ago. Um, it was created by the UN Security Council to uh, uh, compensate persons uh, suffering injury as a result of Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait. Now, the UNCC is, is the largest claims process that most international lawyers have never heard of. Uh, they have recently wrapped up, finally wrapped up their activities, um, awarding about 52.4 billion, that's with a B, to about one and a half million claimants. Now, they did this through a variety of, of innovative, uh, essentially in administrative procedures. I don't have the ability or the time to go into that here, um, but I think a couple of things bear note. First, uh, compensation was available to a wide range of individuals, and second, a wide range of injuries. And second, the, the uh, uh, commission had some innovative measures to uh, assure that claims could be filed on behalf of stateless persons or others who fell into various jurisdictional black holes. Now, I'll quickly note a third situation. Uh, the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission, this was set up uh, in the wake of a particularly bitter war between Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1998 through 2000, it was created by a bilateral agreement by the parties. Uh, it, that agreement was quite state-centric. Uh, it provided that uh, claims would be brought by the states for injuries suffered from violations of international humanitarian law. But there was a capacity under the agreement for individual claims as well. Uh, not much use of this was made, and it didn't turn out not to be of, of, of very great consequence. But the recognition was there. Now, the state-centric character of the commission was a source of concern for, uh, I think, all of the commissioners, uh, given the realities of, of Ethiopia and Eritrea and the nature of, of their of conflict and the consequences of that conflict. Um, unfortunately, the legal, for better or for worse, the legal framework did not permit the possibility of compensation directed at uh, particular individuals or injured groups. Uh, the commission uh, responded by urging the parties uh, to consider means by which they could utilize any damages uh, that uh, might be recovered. Uh, to pursue uh, certain humanitarian objectives, such as providing health care, uh, agricultural rehabilitation, and other services. Uh, in the event, this I think turned out not to have much consequence, but it certainly uh, reflected an attitude that uh, maybe in a situation like the Ethiopia Eritrea War, individually directed compensation was both administratively unfeasible and maybe not the best response. I'll conclude by noting that there, I think, was some resonance of these same concerns in a couple of the uh, separate opinions by Judge Yusuf and Judge Salam in the, the recent uh, DRC, uh, Uganda DRC case, uh, where I think both of them uh, reflected concern about this same sort of state-centric uh, emphasis. And we'll see as we go forward whether uh, uh, their concerns are mirrored as, as states uh, hopefully continue to look for innovative ways to move out of the strictures of diplomatic protection. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting perspective and also really telling us how much it has changed uh, the, the, the relationship and the compensation, both in terms of uh, what kind of claims are admitted and who can claim and of course how um, important it is that actually it is for the individuals to um, to be awarded the monies uh, directly. Um, you mentioned uh, briefly the uh, Uganda DRC uh, decision, the compensation decision that just uh, uh, was uh, uh, published by the International Court of Justice. And I wonder, Massimo, if you can tell us a little more about that um, and maybe in more details, because this is a very interesting decision that, that looks into the examples of the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission and the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, 
Um, and so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that and also kind of what are maybe are some of the, um, the, the obstacles that the court uh, um, may have, may have um, uh, found or, or uh, what, what are, how you can kind of uh, take into consideration also um, the empirical data. Okay, thank you very much, Chiara. Uh, yes, so I would like to start, first of all, with a couple of general remarks about the case, because it is quite complicated, and the merits phase actually closed in 2005, it's nearly 20 years ago, and not all of us might actually remember uh, the nooks and crannies of the case itself. So the case, as we know, um, as we at least know, uh, started uh, in, uh, um, stemmed from the conflict between Uganda and the DRC in the late 90s to early 2000s. Now, the idea was that there were cross-border incursions that were being done between the territories of these two states. And eventually, uh, the Ugandan-led forces uh, conducted a full-scale invasion of the DRC that resulted in the occupation of vast parts of the DRC's territory. Now, the most well-known of those parts is the Ichiri province that I think every international lawyer by now uh, knows by name. Now, uh, together with occupation of territory, uh, Uganda uh, was also found uh, eventually by the NCJ to be internationally responsible for uh, the looting of natural resources, plundering, pillaging of various sorts, but also a wanton destruction of both property and especially uh, human life. And a lot of people, we're talking about people in the thousands here, suffered personal injury and death at the hand of uh, the Uganda-led forces. Now, as I said, in 2005, the SEJ gave its judgment on the merits, holding Uganda internationally responsible. Uh, but the SEJ did not determine the compensation that Uganda was supposed to pay and sent the parties back to, to the negotiating table. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that there came a point where the parties did not actually, um, were not actually able to agree on the appropriate compensation, as it is called. Uh, and that's when the DRC triggered compensation proceedings at the ICJ. And I believe that this was in 2015, 10 years after the 2005 judgment. Now, at this point, I should make a disclaimer. Now, I was at the International Court of Justice as an associate legal officer at the time when the written proceedings in the DRC Uganda compensation compensation phase were happening. Uh, so pretty much everything that I say is only attributable to me and nothing can be attributed to the International Court of Justice or any of, of its members. Now, um, selfishly, I was uh, not unhappy to leave the International Court of Justice before the case uh, DSC Uganda came up for decision uh, in, in the oral phase and uh, eventually in the deliberations. And I say selfishly because um, I believe that the decision for want of a better word, I was afraid of what the court could have done or not done with that particular decision. Now, um, there was a time when I was working on the written proceeding where I realized, when I realized that the court has a somewhat limited capacity to deal with issues of compensation. Uh, now, what do I actually mean by limited capacity? Well, there are legal and factual obstacles in, uh, the, uh, in the course of getting to a compensation decision. Uh, from the legal point of view, I only want to give you one example, and that is the example of the causal link between uh, the damage and the compensation. Now, um, the court has been using this sufficiently direct causal nexus that uh, comes from the 2007 Bosnian genocide merits decision. Uh, and iterated it, in fact, in the uh, DSC Uganda case. But the court, unfortunately, didn't really elaborate much on what it means. And in this respect, I feel that I should give a little shout out to a very good paper that has been published recently on causation in the British Yearbook of International Law by, uh, by my good friend and a CJ colleague, Vladislav Lanovoy. In terms of the factual obstacles, well, the problem here is that the court uh, is, um, faces a number of obstacles when it has to quantify the damage, to put a, a price tag, so to speak, on how much uh, damage it has been caused by a state uh, to another. Just to give an idea, the Democratic Republic of the Congo claimed 13 billion, and that is with a B to follow up on John, uh, 
from Uganda in terms of compensation. And that is more or less half of the yearly GDP of Uganda, to put things in perspective. Uganda uh, was saying that it was happy to pay just under 1 million, that is with an M, dollars. So it couldn't be more disparate, really. Now, how can the ICJ actually assess certain of the heads of damages, for example, that the DRC was claiming? One of them was macroeconomic damage. Now, macroeconomic damage is damage to the entire economy. And again, I really doubt that the ICJ is made of economists that can deal with quantifying macroeconomic damage. So what did the ICJ do? It did the only thing that could have made sense in the circumstances, which is to appoint no one, but a number of different experts. Now, there were other issues concerning the expert appointment, especially the one that uh, it was a panel of non-African experts in an entirely African context, and that is probably a matter for another day or another panel uh, to, uh, to address, and I simply want to flag it for now. Now, we come here now, finally, at the role of the individual in all of this. Now, what can an individual actually gain from a case like the DSC Uganda compensation phase? Well, the reality is that it depends, in my view at least, on the heads of damages that are being claimed by the state in question. Now, I mentioned macroeconomic damage, and there was also, of course, another, um, another head of damage concerning damage to natural resources for looting and pillaging. Now, for those ones are essentially state-centric matters, um, state-centric heads of damages, so to speak. Speak, and the um, individual stands uh, very little to, to gain from a state being awarded compensation under those two heads of damages. But things that may be a bit different if the uh, state is asked to pay, uh, for example, compensation for loss of life, personal injury, uh, and the like. Um, now, the uh, International Court of Justice in DRC Uganda awarded 225 million, with an M, uh, dollars in in, as compensation for loss of life and personal injury. Now, um, this was awarded, however, as a global sum. Now, the global sum approach uh, may be criticizable because, uh, of course, it's, it doesn't seem to be very scientific, so to speak. The court simply pulls a particular price tag out of a hat. Uh, at least that is what I think has actually happened without having been there. Uh, the problem is another one, I think, though. Uh, from the point of view of, in, of the individual, being awarded a global sum is not, I think, sufficient acknowledgement of what actually happened on an individual basis to all these persons that have suffered personal injury or death of a close one in the context of the, con the conflict itself. Basically, what the court did is that it lumped all these potential um, injured persons together, put them in the same pot and said, you are awarded $225 million. But where actually is the acknowledgement of the um, of the injury that these persons have uh, have suffered. Now, one might say, well, that's not the point of interstate proceedings, and I would understand if someone made that particular uh, the particular point. But still, I think that it does actually raise some problems in relation to the position of the individual in the ICJ process in general. The last thing I will say um, is uh, about how the sum uh, will potentially trickle down to these people that have suffered injury. Now, um, of course, as, as John said, this is an interstate proceeding and it is there are no mechanisms in international law for the sum to be awarded down to the person that suffered injury directly. Uh, I'm not aware also of either commitment by the DRC to do so. So um, I will just simply um, stop there for now and uh, give the floor back to you, Chiara. Thank you very much, Massimo. I really think you highlighted some very important issue, the issue of you know, how to uh, the, really link to evidence. How can you make sure that you have evidence for uh, individual claims and the, the, the dichotomy somehow between individual claims and, and mass claims and to ensure that it is the individual that actually get uh, acknowledged uh, and, and also compensated. Um, but I think it's quite interesting when you mentioned also the discrepancy between what was asked and what was kind of received. If I remember correctly, at the UNCC, the initial claims, what was actually awarded was about 10% of what it was initially claimed. Um, and of course, this is a very important issue, issue of compensation and how to uh, um, kind of uh, ensure that the damage is, is, is paid, what are the measures uh, and, and how to evaluate. Um, and of course, we can also look at other bodies of law, investment arbitration on others. But I would like to invite Aristea maybe to, to look into a little bit more at, at one specific body of law and look a little bit at trade and see if we can maybe learn uh, something from there uh, and looking at the issue of individual versus the state and maybe remedies in um, state to state um, trade disputes and how this 
um, these aspects of, of the indi individual claims and, and, and uh, or, uh, damages can be seen from, from a trade perspective, especially when you look into the remedies in, in a state to state proceedings. We, we, we cannot hear you, Aristeo. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Now we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I'd be happy to talk about uh, a little bit about the the the, the compensation. I'm sorry, the remedies available in in the state of state trade disputes because it's it's a little bit different of what we have uh, uh, heard so far, uh, and also the concept of individuals uh, because when we talk about trade uh, and, and individuals, we have to bear in mind that uh, you are uh, uh, including companies, uh, 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 industries. Uh, and, and, uh, and and consumers in the end, right? Uh, and 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 these individuals in the end are the main the, the main players to say so uh, in, in state state uh, trade uh, disputes. Uh, in general terms, uh, an international trade disputes arise when a state adopts and applies a measure that affects trade of goods and services, uh, breaching an international obligation. Uh, and those affecting the, uh, it can affect industries and companies by uh, through the application of these this, uh, uh, measures could be a restriction to the importation of, uh, of a, a certain product. Uh, in that case, a complaining state, uh, not the individuals affected, that's very important, can active the dispute settlement mechanism in a treaty and, uh, and, and, and the contracting the party will defend its right, the rights uh, 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 provided for in the treaty, but also to protect the industry uh, impacted by these uh, measures uh, applied by the, by the other state. Uh, however, in terms of, uh, of the remedies available, uh, the ones that a tribunal finds that the measure breaches the treaty, the states have favored traditionally the, elim the elimination of the measure uh, found inconsistent with the treaty rather than compensating industries and companies affected by the uh, trade uh, uh, restrictive measures. Uh, that's that's uh, an important uh, 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 difference here. Uh, because in the end, uh, it's all about eliminating measures inconsistent with uh, the, with, with, uh, with international trade agreements and, 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 and to keep the flow of trade goods uh, around the world without restrictions. That's was a, that's the objective uh, uh, in, in this in this in this area. Uh, for instance, uh, I would like to talk about NAFTA. Although NAFTA is no longer in in, in, in force, I think it's a, an important reference, historic reference now, <laughs> to, to, to talk about the the, the trade dispute, disputes uh, between uh, states. Uh, in, for example, NAFTA uh, provides more or less the general approach to to this uh, type of disputes in the sense that. Uh, it uh, provides that when a state, uh, when, a, when a panel uh, finds that a measure is inconsistent with a treaty, in this case, in NAFTA, the parties should agree uh, on the resolution of the dispute, which is normally the non-implementation or removal of the measure. That's, that's it. Uh, and, but even when there is no compensation for individuals in, in, this, in these cases, uh, uh, thinking about companies and producers of goods and services, uh, they benefit from the removal of uh, the inconsistent measure in the end because what they want is to continue uh, with their business and consumers want to get a major variety, variety of, uh, of products uh, 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 in the groceries and supermarkets. Uh, uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a very important point as well. And however, if parties cannot or states cannot reach an agreement uh, uh, about the removal or, or how to resolve these disputes, the party affected or the complaining party can suspend benefits of equivalent effects. And, uh, and, and that will take, and that will be in place until the responding state removes the measure found in breach of the treaty. And from the perspective of individuals, the suspension of benefits expands the impact of the original measure because now uh, through the suspension of benefits, the complaining party adopts other measures that will affect other industries and companies. And so this goes, uh, uh, this keeps growing up, uh, this keeps growing up, but in the end, uh, it's a good incentive for states uh, that uh, to comply with, uh, to, to put the measure in, 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 in consistency with the treaty and finish the, the uh, and find a solution to the, to the dispute. That's why, although there is no compensation, the way the, the mechanism is assigned in, in trade disputes, it has worked to, to, to some extent to, to, to resolve the, the differences and provide for the free 
flow of, of uh, goods and services. Uh, so the other point that I would like to make is uh, that uh, uh, there are some treaties that although there's no compensation in, 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 in trade disputes, state state trade disputes, there are some treaties that have started to go into that area of, uh, of providing monetary assessment, which is kind of a compensation. And there are two particular examples that I would like to highlight. The free trade agreement between the US and Korea that I think is, is one of the first treaties that included this kind of clause where uh, the monetary assessment was looked as a, a way to replace suspension of benefits. So as long as the, 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 the respondent party uh, pays this, this monetary assessment, the complaining party was not going to, to suspend benefits. Uh, that was looked as an alternative. But then, we, we, then the CPTPP or the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement uh, was negotiated years later, and the parties decided to include that component of monetary assessment. But it was not looked as a way to, uh, as an alternative to suspending benefits uh, uh, to the to the uh, responding party, but as a way to uh, uh, incentivize the compliance of the of of, of the of of the of, of, of removal, the removal of of the, of the measure, uh, in the end is 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 uh, the, the 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 respondent party was uh, had the obligate had the obligation to to remove the measure, and uh, it will keep continue paying this compensation, but it, it doesn't get away with uh, complying with the report, and uh, those will be like the the examples that I would like to highlight, and I will stop there because I think I reached my time limit. Thank you very much. So this is very interesting to kind of look into a different perspective through trade and kind of sort of compensation and how that, that works and how that has changed also. Um, this is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all for th thinking about this issue. I'd like to move on to, to a second issue now and look more specifically at how boundaries and international decision affect uh, individuals and also issue possibly of displacement of individuals. Uh, uh, Usura, you can. I was wondering if you can maybe start us out, uh, kind of generally, uh, giving us a general overview uh, of, of of where we are. Uh, maybe with some uh, highlighting also some specific uh, cases, existing cases that you have uh, looked into on this matter. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kiara. It's um, a real pleasure to uh, participate in this panel. Um, and I am I really enjoyed the first part of the discussion on, on compensation and remedies. Um, and I think that where you want to take the discussion now um, really sheds light on the fact that even at the merits case, there's so much to be said about um, individuals and how they're impacted by decisions um, and you know, to the degree to which um, courts actually take that into consideration and state litigants as well. So um, if we look at uh, typically territorial or, or maritime boundaries, um, oftentimes uh, these types of disputes, they carry enormous repercussions for the lives and livelihoods of local populations that are, for instance, you know, living on territories of state litigants. They may suddenly go from nationals to, to foreigners. They may have to change residence or, or possibly their property rights might be affected or um, their identity. There's so many aspects that can be impacted by it. Um, and my research demonstrates that there's not an enormous emphasis on this by courts themselves and actually nor in academic literature either, um, although I'd like to hopefully uh, change that. So if we look at uh, territorial uh, boundaries in particular and the ICJ, so what I've observed is that the court has developed quite a robust and, and rigid methodology, I'd say, when it comes to deciding on territorial disputes. So it will typically uh, follow a process of first seeing whether there's a treaty between the states that might resolve uh, the matter of you know, the, the territorial dispute in question. Um, it will look to see whether there are old colonial agreements, perhaps, between the, um, the independent states' colonial predecessors. Um, to see if those might say anything about the territorial boundaries. So this is uh, known as the principle of uti posidetis juris. And if there really is no legal title at all, a, a tangible legal document, it will perhaps see if a state has um, effective control. So through its actions or behavior, um, you know, showing some kind of sovereignty over uh, the territory in question. So 
As you can see, this type of system that it's set up really doesn't leave room for human considerations, even where state litigants have actually brought such things up. So um, asking for case law, Kiara, I can mention the um, El Salvador versus um, Honduras case of 92, where El Salvador pleaded for the court to consider its people's desires and its identity and, and, and living circumstances. Um, or I can also think of um, Niger having done the same in the Burkina Faso Niger case of 2013. Um, and the court won't actually factor that into its legal reasoning when it's deciding on you know, who has sovereignty over a certain territory or where a certain boundary lies, but it will typically tell parties two things. So um, the first thing is it will typically say, um, it will recall that the individuals impacted by the case um, have certain rights. So it will, it will very generally kind of point that out to the parties. Um, that was seen in, for example, Benin versus Niger 2005 case, um, Burkina Faso Niger 2013, which I mentioned uh, earlier, um, in the Kasikili Sedudu Island case as well between Botswana and Namibia, we saw that. So those are some examples. Um, the second thing it will do is it will typically tell parties you have to find the solution to any problems that result from what we've decided to do here. Um, so in El Salvador, Honduras, that also happened. But I think where it most famously happened, and this links to uh, displacement, is in the Cameroon versus Nigeria uh, case. So uh, regarding the Bakasi Peninsula in particular, um, which is um, you know right at the Gulf of Guinea, and it was transferred to Cameroon following this ICJ decision. And that was actually met with an incredible amount of resistance on the ground uh, because the Bakassians, they considered themselves to be Nigerian and it actually resulted in, um, in violence. Um, and so Kiara, what you mentioned earlier about there being empirical data, um, in the Cameroon versus Nigeria case, there is um, there is some. Generally, there isn't a lot when it comes to understanding how individuals are impacted by such cases. But um, in that instance, there are, for example, Nigerian scholars um, such as Imeka Derigbo, um, who have clearly stated that, for example, in this case, the, the people of Bakasi, they dreaded the unwelcome consequences of being dislocated from their comfortable connection to Nigeria. So this is something that has come out of um, his scholarship. And it generally indicates that the court's approach might not be entirely satisfactory in my humble uh, opinion. And um, there's similar trends that can be picked up in maritime boundary delimitation, although I don't want to spend too much time on that because I'm sure Massimo will uh, pick up on that and, and, and shed a lot of light on it. But um, essentially, people's desires have uh, pretty much always been rejected as a relevant circumstance in the maritime boundary uh, delimitation process, um, save in one case I can think of, the Jan Mayen case, which was due to the exceptional severity of that situation, so that the catastrophic repercussions that would occur if, if uh, those interests were not taken into account, but that really remains a sui generis uh, case. Um, and historic fishing rights are not something that the court has actually considered either, even though um, state litigants have, have brought that up. Um, and so I can really think of two reasons why um, th these types of considerations have not been factored in. Um, and, and the first one I can think of is this general uh, tendency uh, to, to adopt a sort of a legally formalistic style of reasoning, right? So uh, this idea that non-legal considerations would somehow rob a judgment or even rob the court um, altogether of its kind of objectivity and its neutrality and its credibility. So this was stated clearly in the Southwest Africa cases as a justification to why the, the, the bench at the time would not factor moral considerations into um, its decision. Um, so there's that. And then I think more specifically when we're talking about territorial and maritime boundary um, disputes, the issue of stability is a huge one. So the principle of the stability of boundaries, and that's something the court has reiterated again Again and again in the Temple case, in the Libya versus Chad case, um, possibly most clearly in the Aegean Sea continental shelf case between Greece um, and Turkey. 
And this, this really finds its origins in um, Article 62, uh, Paragraph 2, Letter A of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, and, and it has been, uh, you know, explained in depth by the International Law Commission as well. So there's just an idea that anything involving boundaries should really remain stable and, and, and permanent, right? Um, my humble view is that I think stability is also about how people live out the decision that you've made on the ground. It's also about peace on the ground. And I think that if people are fighting or resisting because they're unhappy about something um, that you've done or they felt particularly unheard in the process, then I think that could be something um, worth considering. Um, but I'd really be interested in hearing what Massimo has to say about the, the maritime aspects. Thank you very much, Isra. You really uh, pointed out many interesting things because um, you know the issue of the sources of law. What what is what are the sources of law, and and how should the ICJ obviously decide? What should they decide? And I wonder when you look at um, kind of different uh, decisions, I wonder if they are changing historically or if arbitral tribunals decide differently than than the ICJ. I wonder whether there can be some some uh, discrepancies there. Um, but it's very interesting. I really want to read your book now, your dissertation. <laughs> it just seems quite really uh, quite interesting to look at the uh, at the individuals and the the importance of decisions on the individuals from this point of view. You mentioned uh, maritime uh, boundaries and you mentioned Massimo's expertise. And I really like actually to, to pass it over to you, Massimo, and ask you about uh, the, the maritime boundaries and whether you can you know, have a parallel discussion of what Yusra just did on, on maritime boundaries and how th those determination may affect uh, individuals. Thank you, Chiara. I will do my best. Uh, so Yusra said that the situation is quite rigid in relation to territorial disputes. Uh, I would say that probably in relation to maritime boundary disputes, the situation is slightly more fluid, as it were. Uh, now, um, in the maritime context, the, uh, con the uh, presence of the individual is especially felt in relation to uh, whether a particular international court tribunal takes into account what we usually call economic factors in the determination of the course of the boundary. Now, I don't like to call them economic factors because at least in my research, what I found is that mostly what the courts and tribunals are concerned with is whether there is access to particular natural resources. So I generally use the idea of access to natural resources more than economic factors. Now, if we start from a historical perspective and we have a look at the very first maritime boundary judicial or arbitral dispute, we go back to 1909 to the case between Norway and Sweden concerning the lobster bank of uh, Greece Badana. And, and my uh, Norwegian and Swedish friends will uh, allow me to mispronounce the name. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. But again, that case was all about whether, a, whether Norway or Sweden had control over these very um, flourishing grounds for, uh, for lobster fishing. Now, if we fast forward to the first modern, so to speak, case on maritime delimitation, the 1969 North Sea Continental Shelf decision, that was, uh, again, uh, about economic resources, but in this case, it was about hydrocarbon uh, exploration in the North Sea. Now, another very important case, and one that is probably close to the heart of the United States of America, will be the 1984 Gulf of Maine case, in which, once again, the main crux of the matter was control over a very flourishing fishing ground that is known as George's Bank, uh, which is roughly shared geographically between Nova Scotia and uh, Maine. It probably depends on uh, whether you ask a Canadian or a US citizen about this. Now, uh, maritime delimitation definitely has, it can have a human dimension to it, but it seems somewhat far removed from the actual uh, decision. Now, the boundary, where the boundary lies can definitely determine the flourishing or the demise of the uh, livelihood of coastal populations, for example. It can be something that triggers displacement of people internally, for example. So if a particular uh, population is not able to fish anymore in the fishing grounds that they have been using for generations, for instance, that might actually push them to uh, displace internally within their own state and, for example, go to uh, a place where they might have uh, 
some some more economic prospects than they would have in their old in their old home. Now the question is how have international court and tribunals actually considered these matters of uh, of human this human dimension? And the reality again, and it seems to be a, a red thread really uh, in this panel, they have considered such matters very little. Now the limitation has been done primarily on the basis of coastal geography so far. So we will see uh, we see that in maritime delimitation decisions we have references to, for example, the concavity of the coast, uh, cutoff effect of coastal projections and so on. However, access to natural resources has been pleaded by numerous states on most occasions actually as a circumstance that might, might lead to the adjustment of the boundary. And in the context of what now we call the three-stage approach, which is the, you know, the general delimitation process that the ICJ and other arbitral uh, and judicial um, bodies use to determine maritime boundaries today, access to natural resources can be one of those relevant circumstances at the second stage of the process that can determine the adjustment of a provisional equidistance line set at the first stage of the process. Now, how do courts and tribunals decide if access to natural resources uh, can determine the shifting of the line? Well, well, they use what we call the catastrophic repercussions test, which is something that user already nodded to, and something that actually comes uh, and was formulated first by the ICJ in the, well, by the chamber of the ICJ actually in the Gulf of Maine case back in 1984. Now, at the time it was actually Actually formulated as a, as a test to assess the overall equitableness of the boundary. It was the last thing that the chamber did in the Gulf of Maine case. And in, the, in, in time, it was shifted uh, uh, you know, up uh, in the process in a way at uh, the second stage of, of the three. Now, USRA did say that there's only one case in which there has been a shifting of the boundary so far on, on the basis of access to natural resources. And that was the uh, Greenland uh, and Yamayan case back in 1993. The reality is that if one reads the decision, the ICJ doesn't even seem to make much of the catastrophic repercussions test. What well, the ICJ actually does seems to, well, they, they talk about it, they say that the test exists, but then they go on to say, well, if we don't shift uh, the boundary, then fishermen that uh, leave from Greenland will not have, be able to have access to these particular fisheries, uh, hence we need to shift the boundary. That was basically the, the general idea. Now, what does it show? Uh, what does the jurisprudence of maritime delimitation show? That maritime delimitation remains a very state-to-state, -state, essentially geographical process. Uh, and the question again becomes, what can be done to ensure a greater participation of, uh, of a person? Uh, and in my opinion, the only thing that could be done is simply to, uh, to change the entire process. I don't think it can be done easily at the moment without having to, uh, to change the thing, uh, the, the process itself as we know it. So we'd like to stop there for now and give the floor back to you, Kara. Thank you very much. A new radical approach, Massimo. I, I, I want to read your book also <laughs> and see how you, how you explain this. I think this is very interesting. Um, now, I, I want to... Now, we, we kind of looked generally at territorial boundaries and maritime boundaries, and I wonder uh, if you can go into a little more specific. John, may I ask you something about specifically uh, uh, issue of the effects of the displacement of people and looking at issues of mass expulsion and also uh, how these might be related to nationality issues. I know that the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission uh, looked into that uh, in, in one of its decisions. And of course, uh, there were tangential issues that were also discussed in uh, at the UNCC. Um, very briefly, can you maybe uh, explain a little bit of what, um, what, what the status there is? No, um, very briefly, and basically the parties agreed in Ethiopia Eritrea, I think, on some principles to sort of minimize uh, some of the consequences of expulsion. Uh, there was a lot of dispute in the in the in that context about who was and was not an Iranian, uh, sorry, an, an Eritrean or Ethiopian nationality national, uh, and the parties to agree to a degree, and then the tribunal, I think, sought to finesse those issues. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the Washington prerogative and perhaps answer a question different than the one that you, that, that you posed, if I may. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in boundaries, and I really can't add to uh, my colleagues a very, very well-informed expositions on how courts have dealt with these things. Uh, my own experience was limited to working on the Gulf of Maine case a long time ago, and I learned two important lessons, one of which was that um, 
you don't trust charts or the people who draw them. Uh, and the other of which was uh, taught to me by Bob Hodgson, the then geographer of the Department of State, uh, who said that where there is jurisdiction uncertainty, there are resources. And, and that of course is a, is, a, is a wise principle. I'd like, if I may, just to, to step away and, and look at this from a, maybe a, a little higher, higher angle, if, if you don't mind. Um, I, I've been, well, one of the advantages of not going to the office every day is you get to read books occasionally. And I have been reading a little bit about some of the great historic events where the absence of boundaries or the creation of new boundaries have led to enormous adverse effects on individuals. Uh, the terrible consequences of the participation of the, the, uh, uh, the partic partition in India in August 1947, which resulted in uh, the migration of millions of people, uh, great cruelty, great brutality, a, a great deal of violence and death. <clears throat> then again, the, the sort of mass displacements of people in the wake of the Second World War, particularly ethnic Germans who were uh, fled or were driven from their historic homelands uh, in East Prussia, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, <coughs> I saw some numbers that more than 12 million people were, were affected. I think the numbers disputed. And, and we're seeing something of, of this same kind of displacement again today. Uh, where at least in part a, a dispute over boundaries is leading to uh, huge displacements of, uh, of uh, uh, Ukrainians. And I, I'll close here with a little vignette, which again, I apologize, Kiara, it's, it's not quite what you asked me to do, but it's something that I found rather moving. Uh, the New York Times the other day had a picture of uh, uh, a little train station um, in a little Polish town, it's not a little town, it's about 65,000 people, a Polish town, I will attempt to pronounce, uh, uh This is a little town about 10 miles from the Hungarian-Polish uh, border. Um, most, uh, the, the Times reported that the Poles were receiving the Ukrainians, treating them graciously. They interviewed a veterinarian who was treating their pets. Uh, now, most Americans have never heard of this place, uh, but it was a uh, prominent, it played a prominent role in the First World War. Uh, it was then on the frontiers of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and it was the scene of a, a great fortress. It was a scene of a great siege and battle between Russian and Austrian forces in 1914-15. Uh, and this was sort of reflective. I, I'm going to tie this back to boundaries. This place, this location, uh, it was in an area that historically was marked by the absence of settled boundaries, of settled jurisdiction. Uh, since its creation, it was variously governed by the Moravians, the Kingdom of Poland, by Rus, by the Mongols, by the Swedes. Uh, ultimately, the Austrians took it over in 1772 and created a relative period of stability uh, until the First World War, uh, when the place was briefly occupied by the Russians um, it was then the subject of intense fighting between Ukrainians and Poles in the Polish-Ukrainian War of 1920. The Poles won, they got the town. It was part of Poland for 20 years, then came the Second World War, and it was divided by Russian and German forces until the Germans took it over, uh, until the Red Army took it back in 1944. And through all of this, it is a situation where uh, the Jewish and other minority communities were subjected to sustained recurring abuse, um, mass deportations, ultimately genocide. Uh, many of the city's non-Jewish uh, leaders and intelligentsia over time, over the, over the decades, uh, were also arrested, deported, or executed. Now, what does all this have to do? Well, it, it is simply a demonstration of how borders are important. This particular little town uh, has been uh, an object lesson of the, the sufferings of individuals uh, attributable to the lack of settled borders as the neighbors push back and forth seeking to assert uh, uh, claims over it. 
Now that is not what, what you asked me to do. And for that, I apologize, but it just, I was so struck by this picture of this lovely little train station, the Hungarians getting off the train in a place that today seems peaceful and, and indeed benign, but that historically has been such a scene of violence and bloodshed. Thank you. I think this is it's, it's very important it's to, to think about really the, the, the specific repercussion on people. And so thank you actually for, for um, this is obviously the, the, what we're thinking about in this session, but I think your example really showed uh, how the, the repercussions are immediate. You can see that now and you can see now what's happening with I think 11 million displaced. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really something that you have to think about and uh, the, the, the importance of state actions on, uh, on the individuals. Um, so thank you actually for, uh, for sharing that. Um, as always, unfortunately, we have limited time and I would like to move on now to our uh, last issue. Uh, we are moving kind of away from boundaries and looking more specifically at trade, which we mentioned already before, but I would like to ask Aristeo to look more specifically at trade issues and how trade creates uh, winners and losers also in, in, in international law. And I wonder if you can, um, as we said before, give us a, a general overview as we've done before, how, how uh, give us a general overview and, and maybe more specifically um, with an eye at your experience in Mexico. Yes, thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, well, what I would say the, uh, in this section and to, to uh, the, the, my comments will be kind of a, focus on, on, on one specific, on two specific cases uh, that can show this uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to say losers and winners. Uh, there was some losers and winners in, in these disputes, but uh, uh, I think it's also uh, a, a reflection on how the unintended consequences of trade disputes can go beyond, uh, uh, can, go, can, can, can cover some other uh, industries that are, were, were not originally uh, involved in the dispute. Uh, and, and talking about Mexico's experience, uh, uh, what I can say is that uh, indeed Mexico has been one of the, has been one of the main players in the in state, state trade disputes uh, before the WTO, the World Trade Organization, mainly. Uh, but uh, the cases that I would like to briefly mention uh, uh, were, were in the context of the NAFTA again, because the NAFTA, I think, was uh, the, after the WTO was the, 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 the four were, were, were the four were these trade disputes, uh, uh, the most important trade disputes for Mexico took place. And I think that uh, the, the, the best example I can think of is the US-Mexico disputes on, on, on sweeteners. Uh, it involves the, the exports of, uh, the, uh, involve the sugar industry and the, and the fructose, in, fructose industry in, in, in the US. And basically, just to give you an overview, uh, the, the NAFTA, NAFTA imposed several conditions on Mexican sugar exports uh, to the United States during a period of 15 years. Uh, and uh, however, the NAFTA also uh, provided that if uh, Mexico achieved a net production surplus, it was going to be able to, to export the entire production to the US. So a year after the NAFTA entered into force in 1995, Mexico achieved that level of production. Production, and uh, however, uh, Mexico and the U.S. never agree or, or interpreted in different way, ways, uh, which uh, what the net production surplus definition uh, meant in, in, the, in the treaty, and that created a, a huge uh, uh, dispute between the two countries. Why, Mexico? Uh, uh, all the production of sugar in Mexico uh, 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 could not be exported to the U.S., where at the same time, Mexico was starting to import fructose from the U.S. in high quantities. And the fructose was used, as a, uh, to, replace, was used to replace sugar in some sectors. For instance, the producers of soft drinks in Mexico started to shift uh, between, uh, from uh, sugar to fructose from the U.S. So that created a huge problem in the, in the domestic market in Mexico because the Mexican, the sugar, the Mexican uh, sugar industry could not export those excellence and, and it started to lose market share in Mexico. Mexico, the government of Mexico uh, expressed these uh, concerns and uh, tried to uh, establish a panel uh, to, to settle this dispute with the US. However, because of a defect in the, in the text of the NAFTA uh, 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 to establish a panel uh, and which basically uh, uh, 
provided provide the NAFTA provider the the, the, the the two disputing parties must agree on the establishment of the panel, which the US never agreed to. And that's why it created an, an obstacle for Mexico to 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 establish this panel and, and settle the dispute. So Mexico could not there was no legal venue for Mex for the Mexican government and the Mexican industry to to uh to 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 achieve its goal of export this surplus of sugar. And uh and and this created an uh ramification of different types of legal uh, uh, disputes uh, uh, between the two countries. Uh, the Mexican government imposed some restrictions on the importation of fructose from the US. Uh, uh, Mexico imposed some anti-dumping duties on the, in the same product from the US again. Uh, the US went before the WTO and uh, challenged that those uh, anti-dumping duties uh, and, 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 and and but but yet the importation of the fructose from the U.S. Uh, it was still in place, and also the Congress, Mexican Congress, adopted some so adopted some uh, uh, taxes, internal taxes uh, for the soft drinks producers or made with uh, fructose from uh, with fruct fructose basically was direct to to hit the U.S. industry, and that created an, another another battle uh, uh, because the U.S. investors, uh, uh, the U.S. fructose investors. A, a, a challenge or a, a claim uh, uh, that Mexico had had to expropriate or have have breached some of the investment obligations in the NAFTA, and there were some ISDS cases as well. So in the end, it was a, a, a very complex uh, uh, ramification of uh, of, uh, of uh, disputes, type of disputes. And the fact is that uh, the, the Mexican sugar industry could was never able to export that uh, surplus of, uh, of of sugar in, in a free mar market uh, war. Uh, uh, right now, the the, the the exports of sugar uh, to the U.S. is regulated and subject to anti-dumping uh, and, and and contravailing duties, uh, and that's the example that I wanted to 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 show to to to, to describe to show how trade disputes also create this kind of a losers and winners, but this is an unfortunate way of uh, how things can 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 go in the end. Uh, before just uh, concluding my intervention, because I think we're reaching a time limit, uh, I just, just like to highlight an, an important, what I think is an important uh, uh, a feature in the USMCA, the new, still we can say the new USMCA, the agreement between the US, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, this agreement, uh, the, the dispute settlement mechanism in this agreement uh, has a, a very interesting uh, a kind of a, a future uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this chapter, which is uh, called the uh, facility specific rapid response labor mechanism. And what I want to, to mention is because now uh, with this mechanism, uh, workers uh, have a very and uh, have a very important uh, role to play in trade disputes. Uh, because through this mechanism, uh, uh, parties, states, uh, the US, Mexico, and Canada can address allegations that workers uh, in a facility are being denied the right of free association and collective bargaining. And this was something, this is something new that has never been the, uh, included in a treaty before and uh, highlights the importance that uh, labor rights and workers uh, have now in trade. Uh, we don't know if this is going to be the trend in the future for other uh, free trade agreements, but in the, but I think this is, this is a, a, a good starting point. Uh, it shows that uh, there's a, a, a strong commitment uh, in favor of protecting uh, labor rights, and these individuals, uh, the workers, uh, have now play an important role in the in the complex uh, uh, context of uh, trade disputes between the states. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ocha. This was very interesting. Thank you for pointing out how the situation has changed and maybe we have learned and uh, for, in, in this new in the new treaty, but also pointing out the ramification that certain uh, provisions can have in such a long term in such in so many different uh, in so many different ways. Uh, Yusra, I know that you also looked briefly in your uh, in your dissertation in the decision. I wonder if you can offer any comments uh, briefly. Yeah, um, well, uh, thanks a lot. It was really insightful hearing from Aristeo about the, the NAFTA and the USMCA. Um, I think um, in the area of trade, it's pretty important to look at what the WTO has been doing as well. Um, I, I can only offer you know, more of a, of a researcher's perspective as opposed to a practitioner's perspective. So I think that when we're talking about how individuals um, can be impacted by um, trade disputes or how they are impacted by trade disputes, there 
is actually not a lot of literature um, on this, but I think um, to, to respond to, to Chiara, your, um, your, your question of, of you know, winners and, and losers in the trade context, I think that whether individuals can be winners at all in the, in the trade context would really depend on the degree to which uh, the WTO uh, panels and, and you know, the former um, appellate body um, decided to consider them. And I think that there are two main strands, so two avenues um, in which this, uh, this uh, is and, and to a certain degree was with regard to the AB uh, possible. So um, in terms of uh, a, a jurisprudential um, consideration, um, and then I'll get to a procedural consideration, but when we're talking about jurisprudence, um, you know, the, the WTO agreements do offer um, exceptions uh, to international trade, so uh, ways to restrict international trade to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to protect certain human considerations, for example, to protect public morals or, um, or human health, for example. And this is something that is featured in all WTO agreements, the, 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 the TBT, the, on, you know, the technical barriers to, to trade, but also the SPS um, and the, the, the intellectual property the trips. Um, I'll just perhaps focus on the GATT here. So Article 20 of the of the GATT. And um, my research shows that it's more the environmental angle that really allows for human considerations to be factored into WTO dispute settlement in, in that way. So states have uh, occasionally advocated for, for people's rights, similarly to, to the way that they've done in regards to territorial disputes, which I was talking about earlier, um, or maritime disputes to a certain degree. So in the trade context, um, an example of a case I can give um, which is fairly well known, it would be the asbestos case between um, Canada and the uh, then European communities. So Canada wanting to um, import some uh, cement with asbestos into France and France banning this to protect its citizens' health, right? So this exception was actually um, upheld, um, even though generally these conditions and exceptions are quite strict, right? You need to prove that there really is a necessity and that there, there's no other way to protect uh, uh, for example, in this instance, your citizens' health, um, except by really restricting uh, the 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 trade, so that the import of whatever good in the way that you've you've done, um, and this necessity um, criterion featured in Article Twenty of the GATT. Uh, the lack thereof has been a reason why many um, uh, disputes, um, you know, many states have been losers in this in this respect. Um, so, for example, uh, in uh, for example, a, a dispute between the U.S. and China on on publications on audiovisual products, in which it was considered that the necessity criterion had not been met. So it's it's not something to take lightly or that has been taken lightly, um, especially if we combine it with the, the chapeau of Article 20. So um, not only uh, do you have to prove that it's necessary, but there also has to, has to generally not be a, a disguise to trade, right? So you can't say that you're restricting the measure when actually you're just kind of, uh, you know, disguising um, this as a, as, a, as a means of protectionism. And equally, you can't be, um, uh, you know, uh, practicing discrimination towards um, other states. So it can't be applied unfairly. So it's really, um, it, it's, it's difficult actually for all these requirements to be uh, met. Uh, and I think that these th types of cases revolving around these exceptions to protect uh, people's interests in some cases, it shows that states, they, they do occasionally have a desire to, to factor in human considerations. Um, and the jurisprudence shows how difficult that that can actually be because of the, the you know, the, the, the conditions and the way that the jurisprudence is interpreted. So I think that's, that's a way that we can, we can uh, look at, um, at this idea of um, individuals being impacted in trade disputes. And the other that I made reference to earlier or the procedural avenue um, is, um, I think, if we look at um, Amicus Curiae briefs um, in the very, very briefly. You, uh, sorry, user, because of what time is up? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
And then, go, go ahead, but very briefly with the amicus oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, so um, there is actually, there are some empirical um, studies on amicus curiae and how much it's actually been used um, uh, in, in, you know, attempted and practiced in front of the WTO. And most amicus curiae briefs are actually lodged by NGOs that do not have um, you know, with non-economic interests as opposed to businesses. So this is about 45%. Um, so we see that, you know, human considerations are, are, um, are they try to kind of get them through the door of the WTO um, through amicus curiae briefs. And I thought that was interesting to point out as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, we would love to stay here and, and, and talk more, but unfortunately our time is up. But before we conclude, I would like to offer the floor maybe to John Massimo and very briefly also to Alistair Yusra. If you want to add anything and comment, maybe one minute each uh, about what we have said before, uh, what have others uh, said before, uh, we have uh, really a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass, I've talked enough already. <laughs> And uh, Chiara, if you don't mind, I will follow up on John, actually. I talked enough already. I think I made my point. <laughs> okay. You was ready to say, I don't want to scare you, but unfortunately, you know, we only have an hour. Same for me. It's, it's fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you then very, very much. I think what we, what we really showed is that we can, we can talk. This is such an important issue, thinking about the fact of the individuals, the relationship between the state's action and the individuals and how individuals are affected. Uh, by action of the state in so many different ways in, in terms of trade, but also in terms of, of boundaries, in terms of, uh, of compensation. Rich conversation, I thank uh, the, the, the panelists very much uh, for, uh, for engaging today with these issues. I look forward to many more conversations on this. Uh, I want to thank uh, Azil for, uh, for hosting us and like to also thank Karen Kaiser for, uh, from the program um, committee for all her help uh, in putting up this um, uh, this panel. Thank you all.